All right, we're back here with my boy, Dr. Jordan Shallow, and I got him in here to give us some tips uh, on his ritual before he deadlifts. This guy is a, what are you deadlifting right now? What are you? What are you? Uh, 727. Seven, 700, yeah, a lot more than me. So that's why we have him in here today to teach you guys this. Uh, and why, too, I wanted Jordan to go over this is because not only uh, is the guy strong as hell, but he's still functional, he still moves well. A lot of these power lifter guys that are pulling 700 plus pounds can't tie their shoes. So uh, I want to talk to you about how does a guy your size pulling that much weight stay in, in, in good functional shape? And I know it's part of your rituals and the yeah. way you take care of your body. Uh, I mean, for me, it's like you gotta look at, you gotta find certain gatekeeper exercises for you. Exercises that if you start neglecting, you're gonna notice performance, pain, function all start to diminish. So I always start with um, some form of dynamic stability just to give me a litmus test of where I'm at that day. I'm sitting in the office all day. Might have to do a little bit more work than if I'm up on my feet. Um, so I go right into like the, the wide stride walking lunge, but I think too about um, basically trying to create dynamic stability of the entire hip first, because that's gonna be where we are inefficient in transferring power from the floor into the bar. And now what you're saying, are you being just like you wanna get good, strong pelvic control, is that why? I mean, That's part of it. I mean, I want, there's range of motion of an exercise and there's range of motion of a joint. Right, So I can do a deadlift, conventional deadlift, to a full range of motion. That doesn't mean I'm loading my hips, shoulders, and back to their potential full range of motion. So I find if we, we start to let the walls close in on us and we don't have these gatekeeper drills that we do before we start training, then all of a sudden our full range of motion of the joint just becomes limited to that full range of motion of the exercise, and then we start to have problems. And what you mean by the, the walls closing in is that you know we get so fixated on a movement or an exercise, and that's especially like power lifters yeah. with just wanting to be strong, that sure, you're strong in that small range of motion, sure. but then outside of that, you can move. Yeah, no, if you don't have, I mean, a, an adequate end range of motion to load, but also strength and stability in those end ranges, then that's a recipe for disaster. Okay, so what are, what are, what's one of the deadlift so, rituals you got here? Uh, a couple that I like out of the gate. The first one I usually start with, sort of variation on that long stride walking lunge we've done before. So yes. we're gonna sort of leave this alone. So what I like to do is basically, whether it's loading hips, loading shoulders, think of that ball and socket, right? I'm gonna drop a bit of paint right on that top, top in this case, my uh, femoral, net, femoral head and that hip, and I wanna paint that entire inside of that acetabulum, That's right? So cool. But from a stability standpoint, I wanna do that grounded. So a lot of people will warm up their hips with, with resistance, but in this case, especially as a, as a conventional deadlifter where my hips are sort of stacked over my knees and toes, um, that stability is gonna be more so the ability to resist force, not the ability to exert force. So if we you know, start doing these banded monster walks when you know, if I push out this way, I'm overcoming, I'm exerting force through that lateral plane with that glute mead. But when I deadlift, if all goes well, I shouldn't be doing this while I'm deadlifting. They should be working behind the scenes to allow my prime movers to move as efficiently as possible. So okay. I want them to be stable, I don't want them to be strong. So, are you, so that being said, this is something that you would do, because I know I see guys do that, right? Mm -hmm. They do the tube walking before, you would recommend something like this over that. Oh, absolutely, because I think, I mean, from a More functional standpoint, yeah, because I think you know, from stability, from a functional standpoint, sure, the deadlift, we call it a functional movement, for lack of a better word, and it's kind of a buzzy thing to say. But function as humans, bipeds, we're walking, walking, right? So if we extend out that gait cycle and allow ourselves, allow our hips and pelvis to be able to go through that long range of motion, then we can see where our, our instabilities really lie. Um, overcoming resistance through a sagittal plane when we're moving sort of just vertically through a, a deadlift, not much transfer, not much carryover. So it's like if I'm gonna program accessories to get my deadlift stronger, with that sort of dynamic correspondence, I'm gonna do, you know, train my upper back and train my quads and train my hamstrings. I'm gonna also train my corrective movements with that same sort of uh, uh, d directed, tailored intent so to So right exercise. away, you saying that makes me think of what you taught me with the, with the lunge, mm -hmm. where you open your hips up at the same time. Yeah. Because that makes way more sense when you say that, and that's why you would do that. Instead of doing a two walk, where maybe we get some glute meat involved, you can do that with the, with the lunge by opening the hips up. So that's gonna be part of it. And that's gonna be the first okay. part. So we're gonna step forward into that lunge. 
Again, we're going to open those hips up. We're going to keep that chest. And so when you say that, you're, you're, you're pushing the, both the knees out, right? So, yeah. So sort of a principle is um, we have stability. I think of a stability as 100% value, right? So we, and of that 100%, we can make it up partially from structure, partially from function. So we want to make sure that regardless of where we're at, that we have both of those. The structure is sort of a, a preset number, and we need to make sure that function is there. But it's a, it's a waving medium of, of, of relationship of based on position, right? Right now, I don't need functional stability, right? Because I'm structurally in a very sound position. But as we go through increasingly unstru unstable structural positions, i.e. deeper hip flexion, external rotation, that's when we need to call on the stability of those muscles that are meant to sort of just pull the guy wires of the joint to allow our prime movers to do what they do, right? So this is sort of a theme throughout this whole series is as we go through deeper hip flexion, we lose some of that structural stability. That's why we want to call on the functional stability that glute meets. So we're going to come down and as we I want it to be gradual. I don't want it to be straightforward and then doop, pull out. I want it to be, as you go through that deeper hip and knee flexion, then it's just this very gradual hips open, not forgetting that back hip. Now from here, lead with that sternum up, pull with that quad. We're going to leg drive into the floor. We're going to get into this position. Now, this is the swing phase of gait, right? So if I was Usain Bolt and I was trying to run the 100 and I was trying to run it from here with no lateral stability in my pelvis, I'd be done, right? right. But he can get that to here. He's running a different race. He's running 11 strides to their 14, right? So with that in mind, we're going to sink down, open up, pull with that sternum straight into that top position, try and find that balance. And now back to that theory of like painting the inside of the acetabulum, right? So now with this hip loaded, we're going to sink down into a Romanian deadlift on that one leg. Use the hands as a marker. So if we go fingers right to the ground, we'll be able to tell when we start to cheat we start to give way and move in towards that structurally stable position of the hip, which will start to pull up. So if we go both fingers to the ground, we're going to try and just work on that pure hip hinge. And then as we approach that more structurally unstable position, yeah. that sort of tabletop chest to the floor, then we're going to start to explore our stability in that position. So we kick back, we're going to reach down to the floor, and then from here, purposefully, Start to explore your stability. I was just gonna ask you if you're gonna do that. So this is what he's doing when he's in that position is he's he's you're moving from the hips. Yeah, this is right? my left a lot, hip. A lot here. of people when they see that they're gonna want to move from the shoulders. No, it's all it's all left. Oh geez, see if I can figure it out here. It's all left hip dictating the movement. So I'm gonna drop that finger down. I'm gonna let that give way to the glute meat. I'm gonna pull. It's all here. Yeah. So I forget the name of this move. We actually have this, Doug, in our, in, our, in our Prime Pro, where you get over into this position, and then I'm trying to open that up as much as I possibly can in yeah. a controlled fashion. But it's coming from the hips, yeah. not from the shoulders. When most people see that, they think they're, you're just kind of rotating the torso, but you're really... Well, if they rotate the torso, they'll, they'll overcome their stability of the hip. The movement has to come from the hip, because that way it's, it's self-limiting to your stability. If you start throwing your massive upper body around a very limited base of support, you're gonna fall every time. I love the analogy you gave of the, the paint mm. because that, that's really what we're thinking about. And, and when I, I used to just say, we're just trying to wake up all these muscles that yeah. are around this joint that's so... Well, that's, and it's the thing, it's like the, the, the misnomer of like how many times I hear all those little stability muscles. It's like, listen, we all have the same amount, other than like a few vestigial muscles that are still hanging around, we all have the same amount of muscles, right? designate them, give them the name, know their origin, know their insertion, know their action, know their innervation, yeah. and then you'll know why they're limiting. Because if you just go, oh, do stability muscle stuff, yeah. you're, you're losing the force for the tree. It's a gross oversimplification that leads to the undoing of a lot of people. Right, and there's, right? and there's obviously a purpose for exactly what you're doing because we're about to go deadlift. Yeah. Like doing this and then going to do bench press doesn't have very much of a carry over No, to for it. sure. <laughs> I mean, horizontally loaded, you don't need hip stability. But with this, any stability we lose in the hips, like a good litmus test, again, the knees are going to be that trajectory of, of our hip stability. So you'll see when people hurt their lower backs deadlifting, you'll see a knee come in. That's that glute med, so not turning off, but being un, un, uh, unable to carry the load of drawing that femur out and allowing the hamstrings and quads that leg drive. So you don't like saying turning off because that's typically the vocabulary I use. I, I, what I normally say is that you know when when you see that where it's, the knee collapses yeah. like that is that that you're just not very well connected to the glute. Sure. Med. Yeah. The turning off. I mean, unless you have a ne neurological lesion, it's turned on. It's just. You're, you're not calling on it. And I feel like doing this move, we, we, just that alone, the lunge, opening the hips, and then the, and the rotation. What is this exercise called? I, I, we have the name of it. I can't think. Airplane. Airplane. That's what we call it. We call it airplanes, yeah. right? So 
uh, <clears throat> those two basically, I mean, I don't see a need really for the tube walk or the leg swings then. I mean, you're getting all of that. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and it's because it's the dynamic correspondence, right? Like if you're a physique competitor and you want to, sure, maybe, I don't know, because your objective outcome is different than mine. Mm -hmm. But I want more weight on the bar and I want it safely, so I know that as far as dynamic correspondence of this drill, that'll carry over better into the deadlift. Got you. So those two movements? That's a start. That's lower body. Okay. So upper body, we got one set up here. Okay. And now what's kind of the protocol as far as how many repetitions do you do it for? I know you probably just feel your body and you know yourself yeah. well, but what do you recommend? I mean, I, it's hard for people because it's, it's, you want to practice good practice, right. right? So if you're fatiguing those muscles of stability because it's new, bring it to form failure every time, right? And then the idea with this is the more you practice it, the better you get. I should be able to wake you up from a dead sleep get you into this lunge, RDL, airplane combination, and you should be able to rock it every single time, right? But it's, it's gonna be a process from the novice to the intermediate to, to the elite, whereas it's sort, of a, it's sort of a compounding progress. Once you start to get it, then you'll really start to get it because you'll be able to accumulate more volume of good technique and really learn that motor pattern. Mm -hmm. So it can be a little frustrating for those starting out. Um, so even using something like, like a dowel or a broomstick in either hand to just aid in stability as you first start out and then throw the training wheels off and then try to move through with body weight, then you can progress past that. A unilateral load, something to use weight as a stimulus of instability, not resistance. The deadlift is gonna cover the resistance part tenfold. So we just now, I know you get a lot of people that uh, follow you because they're into power lifting and some of that because how strong you are. Do you recommend some of this work um, on like active recovery days where even though you're not going to go deadlift, but because maybe you found you were very unstable in the airplane mode or you have a hard time doing this, would this be something that you would recommend? Sure. And I think it's a great accompaniment to like static stretching because I think static stretching is very like low threshold stimulus where this this requires the nervous system to be a little bit more active. And I think it's a missing piece in a lot of people's recovery, rehab, prehab, whatever you want to call it. They just, they stretch and they lift and they get tight, so they stretch. But the thing is, th the dynamic stability component is that missing piece. That it's basically, you want to go through a distillation process over time where you want to accumulate a lot of volume in these drills, whether that be over a, a day or a week or a month to sort of learn the movement pattern. But the idea over time is, to be able to call, like go through a distillation process and then know that you're very self-aware when you walk in the gym, have these gatekeeper exercises. Like if I can just rock this for a couple sets in between my ascending warm-up sets, I'm good. Right. But if I like face plant my right. first struggling. Rep, yeah, we're gonna take some time. Like if you're gonna get a long car ride, you go to train, you get off a plane, you try and get a lift in, I'll, I'll take some time, do my due diligence to make sure I'm as stable when I hit that bar every single time. Awesome. And then the last one. Yeah, so um, we had talked about this a few times before, the role of the lats in, um, as they pertain to shoulder extension. Mm -hmm. So we got to think extension of the shoulder, right? Most people think from a flex position mm -hmm. we extend, but there's this idea of relative extension of the shoulder, relative flexion of the shoulder, where we're not actively going through that front raise to flex the shoulder. We're keeping the shoulders in the same place. But this is the same thing. It's the same relative joint angle, right? It's just, are we actively doing it or are we relatively doing it to our body position? So what I really like, especially for beginner deadlifters, um, without getting too dense into the anatomy, the, the lat's role of stabilizing the spine and controlling that bar path of the deadlift, um, it sort of gets lost in a lot of people. They try and just hinge at the lower back with a little bit of leg drive. So what I wanna do here, is I want to stand about six to eight inches back from this band almost at tension, oh, okay. right? Because now what we're going to do, we're going to exaggerate that flex position of the shoulder, uh, use the lats to extend, and then we're going to control that bar path as it gets pulled away from us the entire time, mm -hmm. right? So I'm six to eight inches back. I'm going to grab my deadlift grip. I'm going to pull back into my starting position. And all that time, I'm using the lat to yeah. sort of pack that position of the Which lower Which is the back. purpose of the distraction. Exactly. Right, the purpose of this distraction is it's, it's forcing to really concentrate on contracting the lats before you pull. Exactly, so okay. think shoulder blades in the back pocket. Once you sort of feel your wrist, elbow, and shoulder all sort of align with your center of gravity, then it's a quick leg drive into the floor, not to forget that this is still gonna be pulling the whole way. Right. And that's how you control your bar path when you're deadlifting mm -hmm. heavy weights, is any deviation forward is gonna be amplified to the amount of weight that you have, right? So you'll be able to you know, regain your form with you know, 135, 185, but when you start working at really top end weights, any deviation of that bar path, any, any fix of a horizontal movement that's unneeded is a loss of energy and could be a misrep. Mm. So we're gonna sit back, 
grab the grip, use those lats, drop the shoulder blades in the back pocket. We're gonna get the knees over the bar. Leg drive in. So see how it started to pull me forward yeah, on yeah. my toes? Now we're gonna make sure, even on the way down in that eccentric, we're packing those lats in, lower down. Now a lot of people like to reset, pull in. So the intent is all through the back right, of the shoulder Right, right, no, I can see you focusing on what you're doing. It. And even on the eccentric too, because this is the thing with deadlifting, it's the full rep is when the bar reaches the floor again. So if I were to drop this here, it's no lift. Right. In competition, that's three red lights. So the fact that people just sort of drop the weight, we want to make sure, because we've done the work, right? It's the one exercise where it's concentric first. Yeah. Now it's like, okay, this is always going to be easier when we eccentrically load. So now use the work, keep that time under tension, keep those shoulder blades in the back pocket, as you return back to the floor. And this, when you're doing this, because this is you priming your body before you get into your, your deadlift, obviously you're doing this with a lot lighter weight. Yeah. Uh, doesn't need a ton of resistance. No, I mean, that was even a little excessive. Right, it's just, it's just enough for, to send, give you feedback, basically, mm. of what you're trying to do, engaging exactly. those last entire time. Yep. Awesome, dude. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Listen, if this helps you out, make sure you guys like, subscribe, and share. Every single day, we drop a new video. Also, if you guys want to hop over to Jordan, go see some of the stuff that he puts out. He drops knowledge like this all the time. There'll be a link over to his YouTube, too. Check it out.